This is the case against antitrust, and I, I just I have an article from yesterday's USA Today for you. Um, how many of you uh, have ever seen uh, Church Lady on Saturday Night Live, the television show Church Lady? Well, uh, apparently uh, Church Lady was just appointed the head of the new head of the Federal Trade Commission. <laughs> you can see the picture, and I'm going to uh, uh, pass this around. Yes, too. You know, it was a Dana, Dana Carvey. Is that who a church lady? Uh, but the, no, it's really the new head of the Federal Trade Commission. You can, you can look at that. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a <what> church lady. <laughs> she even has a Christian cross around her neck. But uh, okay, well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over. You know. There's a huge literature critical of antitrust, and you can you can hardly make uh, you know the case against antitrust in uh, 50 minutes or something like that. But um, some classic books on the, that are critical of antitrust, the the best I would recommend would be uh, Dominic Armentano's book Antitrust and Monopoly, and then uh, uh, Yale Brosen, uh, the late Yale Brosen from the University of Chicago wrote a uh, a big fat book that was a summary of a lot of the literature as of the early 80s. It was called Concentration, Mergers, and Public Policy. Uh, and read that. And also in some other essays, uh, like uh, uh, I would read, uh, read George Reisman's uh, uh, sections in Capitalism on, on, on this topic. Uh, Ayn Rand's little book, uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, has a classic essay by Alan Greenspan on Al- antitrust, uh, too. He was, he was a good guy back then, uh, in 1962 or, or so. But the Armentano book and the Brosen book are, are two good uh, books if you want to uh, find out uh, about why uh, uh, there have been so many criticisms of antitrust for, for 100 years or so. And, of course, the, the Review of Austrian Economics, Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, have some articles in them also uh, if, you look, if you look through that. And uh, all during the Microsoft saga, um, um, Mises.org published quite a few articles. And you can dig around in there, and there are quite a few of them are pretty, really good, uh, solid articles on, on the whole uh, antitrust in the high tech era. So that's uh, that's uh, reading for now. But I'm going to go over a number of points that I would make in you know in a 45 minute talk on the case against antitrust of why um, why I think it ought to be abolished altogether. The, the mainstream view of all these critics, uh, the, the most vociferous critics for the past 30 years or so, have been Chicago School economists. But uh, when it comes down to it, uh, very few, if any of them, are in favor of, of abolishing antitrust. They're in favor of reforming it. Uh, even George Stigler, who had a bit of a reputation as a, as a critic of antitrust, uh, still always thought that you, we still need antitrust laws. Uh, another big Chicago school critic is uh, Richard Posner, who is now a federal judge. But he wrote a very widely used uh, book on the law and economics of antitrust. I think it was just called Antitrust Law and, Econo- Law and Economics, something like that. You can, I'm sure you could find it if you look for it. But even Posner, in, uh, in his book, that was essentially, uh, you know, every page was critical of antitrust, uh, said that there still was a golden age of antitrust in the late 19th century where market failure existed in the form of rampant cartelization. And that's his exact words. And therefore, there was, a, a, in his view, a, a reason for it. And uh, yes, we, they've made mistakes for 110 years, but uh, there still is a need for it. If we could only get it right, uh, it would be okay. Uh, the late George Stigler in a famous survey article of the theory of perfect competition in the Journal of Political Economy way back in 1956 said, uh, perfect competition requires a Sherman Act. And so if you believe that many firms uh, is a prerequisite for competition, well, you need a Sherman Act because if you have a concentrated industry with only a few firms dominating, we need to break it up, uh, according to Stigler's older view. He might have moderated that later on, but he never gave up on the idea that you needed some antitrust. And, and I think one of the reasons for this is uh, even Chicago's economists still use as their ideal benchmark perfectly competitive equilibrium. And if you, if you accept that as your ideal or your benchmark, I think that it's a lot easier to come to the conclusion that you do need antitrust of some sort in order to have government nudge the economy toward that benchmark. Austrians don't accept that benchmark, and therefore uh, we're a little more skeptical of this, of this whole idea there. And, and basically, uh, so reason number one I would put is I think antitrust regulation is inherently incompatible with competition if you think of competition as 
as the Austrians do, is a dynamic rivalrous process of, of entrepreneurship whereby entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs are constantly struggling to please consumers better than their competitors are by cutting their prices, innovating their products, expanding their product lines, merging, uh, altering uh, their, their, their sales techniques. They're, they're using tie-in sales sometimes, sometimes not. All of these things, advertising, are all competitive devices by which uh, businesses are constantly changing, constantly striving to, uh, to compete, to compete for customers' dollars. Uh, and, and that is inherently incompatible with this old theory, uh, the theory of competition that's in the textbooks that I talked about in my other lecture, and I'm not going to repeat myself, that, that really uses the competitive uh, equilibrium as its benchmark with many firms, homogeneous products, homogeneous prices, costless entry and exit, perfect information. Uh, and, and so uh, that theory leads you to commit uh, one big nirvana fallacy. Or, uh, George told me he calls it the, what, the platonic fallacy, uh, uh, platonic competition, uh, whereby you compare the real world markets to some sort of uh, utopian ideal that could never be realized and then condemn the markets for being imperfect. Uh, you, know, you can't lose there. Everything is imperfect. You're always, everything's imperfect that way. And so reason number one is it's inherently incompatible with competition. And uh, in one of my publications, I published an article uh, uh, back in July of 1988 in the uh, journal Economic Inquiry with Jack Hine. <clears throat> it's called Antitrust and Competition Historically Considered. And uh, it, it came off of, the, uh, off of uh, the end of another article I had published earlier that I'd, I'd run across the fact that when the time the original antitrust laws were passed in the U.S., that the economics profession was almost unanimously opposed to them, almost unanimously. And, and, and we were able actually to survey, I think we surveyed every single professional economist alive in the United States who had a job as a professional economist. Because back then there was only a couple dozen, really. <laughs> there were actually, there, were, there really wasn't much of a, an economics profession to speak of. And uh, uh, there was a, an, an economist named A.W. Coates who wrote an article called The American Economics Club in the American Economic Review that surveyed who these men were. So we were able to use his article to say, well, these are, this was the economics profession back then. And we, we looked uh, through all their literature, their published literature, to find out it, did they say anything about the theory of competition and antitrust? And if they did, what was it? And, uh, and basically what it was was they were almost uniform in their opinion that it was a bad idea. And Jack High and I, uh, the expl explanation we give for this is that back then almost all economists thought of competition as the Austrians do. They thought of it as a dynamic uh, evolutionary process and ine inevitably they came to the conclusion that these antitrust laws were inconsistent with competition. It's a bad idea. And let, me, uh, let me give you some examples of what they were saying at the time. Richard T. Ely, who, who was one of the co-founders of the American Economic Association, was a self-described socialist. But even he said about uh, mergers and, and large corporations that the uh, antitrust laws were supposedly supposed to tame. He said, large-scale production is a thing by which no means necessarily signifies monopolized production. His co-founder of the American Economic Association was John Bates Clark. He wrote that combinations are to play an increasingly important part in economic affairs. That is altogether probable, but that competition is to be a course to a corresponding extent destroyed should not be too hastily accepted. I'm pretty skeptical. Herbert Davenport, the famous, uh, he was sort of a, uh, an Austrian-oriented economist. He said, uh, large firms imply obviously a small number of competitors but do not require the elimination of competition. James Laughlin said, even when the combination is large, a rival combination may give the most spirited comp competition. Simon Patton, the founder of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania said, the concentration of capital does not cause any economic disadvantage at all to the community. Those producers who seek protection through combinations are much more efficient than were the small producers whom they displaced. Economies of scale, in other words. And uh, I could go on. I have you know, a dozen more so quotes like this. But these, these men who I uh, quoted were all like the, univer the president of the University of Chicago, endowed shareholder at Yale. They, they, were, they were some of the most prominent the founders of the American Economic Association. Uh, and, and, of course, if they had that view, the rest of the profession was likely to hold that view, too. And it did. 
at the time. And uh, Jack High and, also, and I also explained that things changed, though. By about the 1920s and 30s, we, we write about this in our article, uh, economists came more and more to accept antitrust in principle. Now, keep in mind, they were against it in principle. They didn't say, well, if it could be changed or reformed, we'd be for it. They said it's inherently incompatible with competition. But that evolved, and uh, George Stigler addressed this. He had uh, a, an essay in the American Economic Review entitled uh, Economists and the Problem of Monopoly. It's in the early 80s, I think it was published. And he pondered several possible explanations of why economists came to accept uh, antitrust laws, antitrust regulation. One reason he gave was they learned that they could uh, earn significantly more than the minimum wage as antitrust consultants. And so they began to think, well, that's a good idea. I can make money on, as an antitrust consultant. And, uh, but, um, but we we don't even bother with that. Our main explanation is that the way in which economists started thinking about competition changed. The perfect competition model became was embraced by the 1930s as the model. So once you embrace that as your model of the of how the world works in terms of competition, then as George Stigler said in 1956, perfect competition requires a Sherman Act. You have to have antitrust if you have to have competition. And so as they moved away from the Austrian-oriented view of competition as a dynamic rivalrous process and embraced this, this sort of mathematical equilibrium uh, as competition, uh, it justified, uh, in their minds anyway, um, embracing antitrust. So that's, and then it evolved again. Uh, during the 1960s and 70s, there was a real revolution. The word revolution is often used in the literature. And, uh, and it's called, the revolution came to be known as the new learning in industrial organization, the field of industrial organization. And then, in fact, uh, there's a book edited by, uh, let's see, the editors are, uh, Fred Weston was one of the main editors. Uh, you could find it. It's called Industrial Organization, the New Learning. And it, I think it was published in the 70s. And it was uh, supposed to be a sort of a, a summary of some of the top articles as of that period that had been critical of um, antitrust regulation in the, in, the, in the 60s especially. And, uh, and it's ironic that they called it the new learning because basically what they were finding is that all these crackdowns by the government on, on uh, mergers and, uh, and big business and large corporations were actually harmful to the consumers because if two companies merge and that achieves economies of scale and enables them to cut their costs and prices and be more competitive, and then you come along and break that up and say, no, you can't do that, well, that's harmful to the consumer. And so they said, hey, this is harmful to the consumer. Let's call this the new learning when actually it was just the old learning rediscovered you know, in terms of these quotes that I just gave you from the economists at the turn of the century who knew this all along. And of course, the, the Austrians were never fooled by any of this. They, they, they never had the new learning old. It was all basic uh, uh, common sense that antitrust always was incompatible with, uh, with competition. There's no need to relearn anything. And so, uh, so that, that's sort of a, another reference for you. Um, point number two, uh, that it was protectionist from the, from the start. Uh, I'm going to mention a little bit that some of the examples from these books by Armentano and others about how, uh, uh, and, and the Journal of Law and Economics, the, the University of Chicago journals, Journal of Law and Economics, Journal of Legal Studies, Journal of Political Economy, published many of these articles that were hypercritical of antitrust regulation. Uh, and so we, we, case after case after case, they criticize as being wrong-headed, bad for competition rather than good for competition. But uh, the Chicago schoolers still say and said then that uh, we still need it because there was a golden age of competition. Well, I, I published several articles myself on this, uh, on this uh, topic, and one of them was in the International Review of Law and Economics in uh, 1985. It was called The Origins of Antitrust, an Interest Group pers Perspective. And, uh, and I looked at all these statements by Richard Posner and others who said, uh, uh, well, there was a, a golden age of antitrust because there was rampant cartelization in the late 19th century and government needed to come to the rescue of this and, and, uh, and address this market failure. And I, I, uh, the first thing I did was to get every book on antitrust that I could find in the library at George Mason, where I was at the time, and I got my research assistant, uh, I put him on, and I said, find me the data where they show that these industries that were accused of being monopolies were in fact doing what economists say they were doing, restricting output and raising prices. Find that out. 
And what we found was zero. We found no book that had any evidence whatsoever on that kind of pricing and output data. Nobody had ever done it. Uh, a few anecdotes here and there, but no systematic look and proof that uh, this had happened. And so, uh, of course, the next step, I said, well, let's find this data. And I had this research assistant, and I, uh, I gave him the job of uh, reading through the congressional record of 1889 and 1890 uh, regarding the debates over the Sherman Act to find out, well, which industries exactly were being accused of being monopolized. So we came up with a list of industries, and then we looked at uh, historical statistics of the United States to the extent they were available to get these data. So, you know, were they restricting output? Were they uh, raising prices? And so, uh, and what I found was that the industries that were being accused at the time of monopolizing and were the basis for why we have the Sherman Antitrust Act were expanding output many times faster than GDP was expanding for the 10 years prior to the Sherman Act. And this was a period of deflation. The price level was falling, but, the, but in these industries, the prices were falling even faster than the, the general price level was falling. So in other words, these were the most dynamic, most rapidly growing, most rapidly expanding, uh, most rapidly, uh, most vigorously price cutting industries in all of America for the 10 years prior and 10 years after the Sherman Act was passed in 1890. And they were supposedly monopolizing. And here's what I found. Uh, I'll just summarize some of these things. The industries that were allegedly restricting output for the 10 years before the Sherman Act increased production on average by 175%. Uh, in, during the decade prior to the Sherman Act. Uh, the consumer price index fell by 7% from 1880 to 1890, according to the government statistics. But uh, the prices of the various uh, so-called trusts fell even more. Uh, steel rail was one of them. The steel rail industry, prices fell 53%. Refined sugar fell by 22%. Lead fell by 12%. Zinc was reduced by 20%. Bituminous coal was pretty much steady during that time. And so this is the kind of thing I found, that uh, the prices were either falling as rapidly as the price level or, in some cases, much faster. And, uh, and uh, production was, was, right, it was increasing seven times faster than the general rate of growth of GDP during the, during the, uh, the decade prior to the Sherman Act. And so uh, we, uh, there are some other interesting nuggets that we dug up from the congressional debates over the Sherman Act. There was a Congressman Mason who said this during the, the debates in the House of Representatives over the Sherman Act. He said, trusts have made products cheaper. They've reduced prices. Well, listen to that. They, they knew they were saying it in the, in the Congress. Cause and effect. Trusts are created. The effect is to reduce prices. But if the price of oil, for instance, referring to John D. Rockefeller, were reduced to one cent a barrel, it would not right the wrong done to the people of this country by the trusts which have destroyed legitimate competition and driven honest men from legitimate business enterprises, end quote. So in other words, what they were saying is, yes, we admit the trusts have achieved economies of scale. They've dropped prices tremendously. I think he uses the word immensely in there about prices. But they've driven less competitive uh, businesses out of the market. And so, and of course, that's the whole purpose of competition. Because <laughs> so, uh, the end result is the consumer gets the lower prices. Uh, and so, so there you have it. That was Congress was admitting that the purpose of this antitrust law was to keep prices from falling so that we can protect these less efficient competitors from competition. That's the opposite of competition. That's called protectionism. That's, that's what that's called. Uh, now, now, so there were a lot of complaints by these uh, sour grapes, smaller competitors who were either unable or unwilling to compete with uh, these other these so-called trusts, the, uh, the larger companies. Now ask yourself this, generally, you're, you're competing in an industry, you're a business person, and there's a threat, there's one or a few large companies that are monopolizing. Now what do economists say businesses do that are monopolizing the industry with regard to price? Price is going up, okay. You're one of these smaller competitors. The big guys are raising prices. Is that good or bad for you? Are you going to complain to the government and say, look into this, stop them from doing this, we suspect they're monopolies? <laughs> no, either if they're, raising, if they're raising their price, then either you can raise your price too and make more money, or keep your price where it's at and underprice them 
And before long, you'll be as big as they are because all the customers will go to you. So you're not going to complain. You're only going to complain if they're cutting their price because they're taking business away from you. And now that you have antitrust law, that is your political vehicle to use to complain against your more efficient competitors to keep them from cutting their prices. So it's a godsend to the losers in American business was the Sherman Act. It was a tool for them to use to beat up on their more efficient rivals. Uh, and of course, uh, there's the old predatory pricing canard that is always dragged out. Uh, the old theory that, well, yes, they were cutting their prices, but uh, they, the idea was uh, they were going to cut their prices, drive the competitors out of the market, and then once they're all gone, jack up the prices to astronomical levels. But keep in mind, this went on. These particular industries did cut their prices continuously for this entire 20-year period. What businessman would work out a strategy and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to lose money for 20 years on every sale we make. And then we're going to drive everyone from the market. And at that point, we'll make a killing. <laughs> in a, in a, but most people believe this. Most people believe this because they never thought about it for more than 10 seconds. I, I, my, uh, my MBA classes, I have people that are uh, 40-year-old engineers for Black & Decker who are going back to school, uh, or McCormick Spice Company, going back to school to get an MBA degree. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I mention this to them, and they seem to think, well, yeah, this is pervasive. This is, people do this all the time. And so I asked them uh, the, the, the question, of, well, what if you went back to work on Monday, this is a Saturday class, and told your boss at Black & Decker, here's what we're going to do. This drill that we sell, it costs us $50 to manufacture. The marginal cost is $50. Let's start selling it for $30 all around the world. And Black & Decker is a big international corporation, so I don't know what their sales of drills are, but it's got to be a lot of drills. And we'll lose $20 in every drill for maybe two, three, four years. But I am convinced that at that point we will drive everybody from the market. And I'm also convinced, furthermore, that at that point if we raise our price to, say, $100, there will be, never be any entry by any new competitor after that. <laughs> I guarantee you because predatory pricing works. Everybody knows predatory pricing works. And I, and I said, well, what do you think your boss would say to you? And they all pretty much unanimously agree that they'd probably be fired because the boss would think <laughs> they 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 you know lost their minds or ignoramuses something like that. So if you, if you think about the logic of this, it doesn't make any sense uh, at all. There was a famous article, um, famous among economists, uh, in the Journal of Law and Economics in the late 50s by John McGee on uh, predatory pricing in the Standard New uh, Oil of New Jersey case, the John D. Rockefeller's prosecution, and he went through the entire court record and. Uh, one of the conclusions he came up with was uh, predatory pricing would be a, an incredibly foolish thing to attempt to try to corner a market like that. And whatever else you could say about John D. Rockefeller, he wasn't a fool. Uh, you know, he, he might not, you might not have liked him personally. He might, he might have forgotten to send you a Christmas card now and then. He might have been a nasty guy, but he was no fool. And he would not have tried this, and he didn't. And he didn't, didn't do this. Uh, even though it's gone down in folklore that he did make money by this way. So the trusts weren't, uh, weren't doing this. They weren't uh, practicing predatory pricing. They are practicing competition by dropping their prices. Now, ne the next thing I did in my research here is uh, I wanted to know from the horse's mouth what the, the media were saying about the Sherman Act. I thought it would be interesting because there have been many, many books by journalists, but I wanted to know what uh, sort of the popular press was saying, not the interpretations of events by... Uh, the muckrakers, as the journalists were called at the time. And so my poor graduate student, who was nearly blind by now from reading a congressional record and microfilm in the library, I asked him to read through uh, New York Times uh, editorials uh, that had to do with antitrust. This was before the Internet. So this is on New York Times editorials on, the, on antitrust during the 1889-90 period. And, uh, and here's one of the things he found that was kind of interesting that the New York Times was originally in favor of the Sherman Act, but then it switched its position, its editorial position, and came out against the, the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, just because they observed what was going on. And here's what they said. On October 1st, 1890, the New York Times said this, that so-called antitrust law was passed to deceive the people and to clear the way for the enactment of this law related to the tariff. They're talking about the McKinley Tariff that was sponsored by Senator John Sherman himself three months after the Sherman Act passed. The Sherman Act passed in July of 1890. The, the tariff uh, was uh, October, I believe, of 1890. 
the Sherman Act was projected in order that the Republican Party organs might say to the opponents of tariff extortion and protected combinations, behold, we have attacked the trusts. The Republican Party is the enemy of all such rings. And now the author of it, Sherman, can only hope that the rings will dissolve of their own accord. And so what the Times was saying was that the Republican Party, which was always the party of protectionism uh, from its very origins, uh, wanted another round of protectionism. Uh, it, the average tariff rate was already in the 45, 50% range. They wanted to make it higher. And, uh, and the New York Times said all this business about the trust law, the antitrust law, was sort of a fig leaf designed to, to uh, divert the public's attention away from the real source of monopoly, protectionism, which is, and they passed the same uh, bill a few years later. Um, another thing I did uh, in looking into the origins here, there were state antitrust laws before the federal antitrust law. There were about two dozen state antitrust laws th that were enacted just a couple of years before the Sherman Act was in 1890. And uh, there was an, uh, an 1889 Farmers Alliance meeting in St. Louis, Missouri, that was, uh, and this was initiated by uh, farmers and butchers, uh, among others. Now, I'll explain why farmers and butchers. But here's what the Farmers Alliance said was why there was a need for a state antitrust law to, uh, to crack down on the, the large corporate farms that were being formed. They said uh, this. They said they, they called for legislation, quote, to suppress all unhealthy rivalry, end quote. So they were very clear about it. They wanted a law to suppress rivalry. And of course, rivalry is a synonym for competition. So they, they wanted a law to suppress competition. Again, the large corporate farms with economies of scale and farming were underpricing the, uh, the farmers. And I recommend once again, read H.L. Mencken's article, The Husbandman on Farmers. It's a change your mind about uh, the noble farmer. Uh, uh, in Missouri, uh, and I did the same thing with uh, the research on state antitrust laws. I, I looked at, well, what industries were being complained about uh, by the states this time, not by the U.S. Congress. And it turns out that cattle, hogs, and wheat is where the action was. Or the uh, cattle ranchers, hog farmers, and wheat far uh, hog raisers and wheat fa farmers were complaining in Missouri about about uh, unhealthy rivalry. And uh, and sure sure enough, what I found was the per head value of cattle from 1884 to 1899. This is when this these laws were passed. Uh, fell by 30 percent. Uh, the cattle supply increased by 50 percent during this time. And this translated into a 38% decline in beef prices, decline in beef prices. Same thing, the price of hogs was 19% lower during this five-year period. Uh, so all three things uh, were declining in price. And uh, the uh, Missouri farmers actually got <coughs> a senator from Missouri named Senator George Vest to put together a, a, a U.S. Senate commission called the Vest Commission to investigate the beef trust. And uh, what was happening was uh, in the meatpacking industry, which was centralized in Chicago, they were centralizing the, the, the beef industry, dressing the beef, and sending it out in railroad cars into the hinterlands and competing with all the local butcher monopolies that were out there. And the butchers didn't like this. And they originally, if you read the history of this, uh, refrigeration was originally opening the doors of trains during the winter months. That was refrigeration. But then they, they, of course, they put it on salt or ice. And then when, when real refrigeration was invented, they, uh, you know, they used real refrigeration. But, uh, but this, this apparently uh, de diminished the price of beef quite substantially to the consumer. And so naturally, there was a lot of uh, complaints about this. And here's one of the, one of the conclusions of this uh, Vest Commission. They said this, the principal cause of the depression, depression, now, in my dictionary, that means something's going down and it's depressed. Okay, depression in the prices paid to the cattle raiser and of the remarkable fact that the cost of beef has not fallen in proportion, what a remarkable fact, comes from the artificial and abnormal centralization of markets and the absolute control by a few operators thereby made possible. And so again, they said there's uh, a centralized control of these markets, economies of scale, leading to a depression in the prices, which signifies a very significant drop in prices, not just a mild drop, but a depression is a, you know, pretty the Great Depression we think of. And so, and so again, at the state level, the origins of antitrust were in protectionism, not not competition. It's contrary to the, the standard fairy tales that you're all taught in school. Uh, 
And so, you know, like I said, there have been many, many uh, exposés of antitrust run amok. And let me, let me just rattle off a few examples from the literature. If you want to find a quick article uh, with some examples like that, in 1998 there was a Forbes magazine article entitled Read Your History, Janet. It was uh, Janet meaning Janet Reno, who, by the way, looks an awful lot like Church Lady in that handout I, I, I gave. But didn't she play Church Lady once or twice on, uh, on TV? And by, by the historian John Steele Gordon. And, uh, and he was chastising Janet Reno for prosecuting Microsoft. And, uh, and he says, you know, read the history. Antitrust uh, has been pretty much the way I've been explaining it here this morning. And uh, so, some examples. Uh, the federal government prosecuted IBM for 13 years uh, for allegedly monopolizing the computer market. During that time, IBM was eclipsed by companies with names like Wang Computer. Uh, and so uh, finally, the judge died and they decided, oh, the hell with it. And they just gave it up in 1982 because uh, you imagine if uh, the day before the jury was to come in on the uh, O.J. Simpson trial, if Judge Ito passed away. They would have to get a brand new judge and do it all over again. Uh, that's, what, that's the way it works. And so they have 13 years of litigation with you know, boatloads and boatloads of documents. They would have had to have got a new judge to get up to speed uh, with all that stuff, so they just, they just dumped it. Uh, in 1962, the government forced the Schwinn Bicycle Company to divorce itself from its network of dealers, which the government claimed gave Schwinn an advantage over its competitors, which, of course, that's the purpose of competition, to have an advantage over your competition. Uh, deprived of this competitive advantage... Foreign competitors drove Schwinn into uh, uh, bankruptcy. RCA was prohibited by federal antitrust regulators from charging royalties to its American licensees. So RCA licensed many of its products to Japanese companies instead, which gave rise to the existence of the Japanese uh, microelectronics industry, which eventually outcompeted the American, the American electronics industry. Antitrust regulation destroyed Pan American World Air Airways by forbidding it from acquiring domestic routes, it flew overseas and it decided we need feeder routes from Chicago and St. Louis and Los Angeles to go to our hubs that go overseas uh, to, get, to bring our customers to our international flights. Uh, and since they were profitable, the federal government said, no, we won't allow you to do that. And therefore, deprived of this feeder traffic, they went bankrupt. General Motors was never prosecuted under the antitrust laws but from 1937 until 1956, it was the policy of General Motors to uh, never let its market share go above 45%. Division managers were instructed uh, to make sure that their cars are not so good and so low priced that they will gain more than 45% of the market in cars because if they did that, they thought they would be the uh, victim of an antitrust lawsuit. And, uh, and that's sort of the unseen negative effect of antitrust. Well, we never know. There's no way of measuring how much more vigorous competition would be if competitors were not frightened that if they're too successful, they'll be sued because they see it happening to their competitors in other industries all the time. Uh, and, so, and so you can delve into this, uh, this literature and, and read about all these sorts of things. Uh, reason number three politicized business is always anti-competitive. In public choice economics, uh, there's a vast literature on how government regulation is usually driven or, or has a, uh, an impetus that is driven by all other kinds of legislation. That is, you, have, you usually have a relatively narrow, clearly defined special interest group that wants to use the powers of the state through lobbying and so forth to get some sort of wealth transfer to itself at the expense of the general public. That's how much regulation operates. For example, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which was established in 1877, was supposed to regulate the railroad and trucking industries. Uh, it ended up being a government cartel enforcement mechanism for the trucking and railroad industries. The Civil Aeronautics Board was supposedly to regulate the airlines in the public interest. It ended up being captured, so to speak, by the airlines and operated a cartel price fixing scheme for the airlines against the consumer. That's been the history of regulation. Uh, and I would argue that antitrust regulation is just like this and always has been. It, it never has been uh, public interest regulation. And the funny thing about the Chicago school people who write about, most of them anyway, who write about antitrust is 
they are the champions of these criticisms of the, the ICC and the CAB and the, all these other regulatory agencies. But they seem to think that antitrust regulation is somehow exempt from these same criticisms and it really is public interest regulation, which it never has been in my view. And so if you think of in those terms that it is just another form of regulation that inevitably benefits special interests at the expense of the public, you'll be much more uh, suspicious of what's going on. And let me give you just one example, and this is where a church lady fits in here. Uh, my, my one example, and you know, there's been a lot written about Microsoft, the whole Microsoft antitrust prosecution. And I'm not going to attempt to go over all the specific charges or any of the specific charges, really. But I'm going to recommend to you a book by a journalist named John Heilemann, H-E-I-L-E-M-A-N-N. -N. I think it's all right that he always spells his name. The name of the book is Pride Before the Fall. And he was a Silicon Valley journalist. I think he wrote for the San Jose Mercury News for, for a while. Or I think he still is writing for them. And he wrote this article about <coughs> sort of the, the insiders involved in the whole Microsoft thing, the whole, uh, where, where it, which it was, was a 10-year investigation by the federal government, uh, which led to a lawsuit. Uh, and first, the, the Federal Trade Commission investigated Microsoft for four years and found them to be doing nothing wrong. And then, immediately, the, the antitrust division of the U.S. Justice Department took over and said, no, we're going to keep at it, and investigated for another five years. And they finally uh, filed a lawsuit. But this book is interesting because Heilman writes about how this all came about, how the, the investigation of, law, of Microsoft and the lawsuit and everything, how it all came about. And it really was a conspiracy, a genuine conspiracy on the part of Microsoft's competitors. And here's what he writes. The conspiracy was hatched in August of 1997. This is the conspiracy to get a lawsuit. The government had already been investigating. But it was hatched in August of 1997 when Netscape sponsored a two-day meeting in Silicon Valley with Senator Orrin Hatch, staff members of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, and the general counsels of other, other Microsoft competitors such as Sun Microsystems and Novell from Utah. That's why Hatch was, was in on it. Novell was a competitor of Microsoft. Uh, Hatch wanted to do something to harm Microsoft on behalf of Novell uh, to, for their benefit. The conspiracy got down to serious work when Sun Microsystems invested $3 million in Project Sherman. Uh, probably it either refers to the Sherman Act, one of the Sherman brothers, either General Sherman or John Sherman. They were brothers. General William Tecumseh Sherman was uh, the younger brother of Senator John Sherman, uh, the brothers from Ohio, and uh, one or the other, that had recruited a bevy of $700 an hour consultants, including Chicago School economist Dennis Carlton, to put together an actual mock case against Microsoft to be presented to the Clinton-Gore Justice Department. So imagine that. Microsoft's competitors put together a mock case then they invite these lawyers from the Justice Department in Washington to come in and say, how do you like this? This is our case against our competitor. And so <laughs> here's what Heilman goes on to say. He says, everyone involved was sworn to strict confidentiality with one of the participants saying, I haven't even told my wife about this. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there was such... This, this was like the secrets to the nuclear bomb in World War II. Yeah. What, what, what was that? No. no. If it got out into the public media that the legal attack on Microsoft was instigated by its competitors, a lot of people would think it's sour grape competitors doing what sour grape competitors always do and try to give their recruit the government to give their rival a hard time. And it would have reduced their credibility that Microsoft was actually harming consumers. Because remember, this is all supposed to be in the public interest. But even Joe Sixpack would be suspicious of if this came out of the news that it was the competitors of Microsoft that were behind all this. Even Joe Sixpack is smart enough, I think, to understand that. It would be as though it would be as though uh, General Motors had a secret meeting uh, and recruited government lawyers to uh, launch a propaganda campaign of attack against Ford. 
you know, people would say, ah, sour grapes, you know, GM is, a, you know, they're competing with Ford. Uh, so if this ever got out, they were afraid it would ruin everything. So Project Sherman presented a whole case with dozens of lawyers and economists as consultants and a trial run just like it was in court uh, almost adopted verbatim as the government's case against Microsoft. So the government did in fact adopt this as its case. So the government's case against Microsoft was their case. Now look at the, look at the church lady and read the paragraph that I, uh, that I uh, underlined there. What does that say about her in the, in the, the paragraph that I kind of circled there? She was, one of, she was the top conspirator. She was the one that did all this. As a, she was a lawyer for the, for the computer company that competed with Bill Gates that wanted to smear Bill Gates and, and, get, and instigate a lawsuit to harass him. So she was, and now she's the head of the Federal Trade Commission. That's, what, that's, what, uh, that's where she is. And so, and so this, this is a classic example. There are, you know, I, could, I could stand up here for the next two months giving you examples just like this of antitrust cases in history where routinely a competitor sues a competitor for cutting his prices, expanding output, creating a new product, being a more vigorous competitor. This is just one among thousands of examples uh, uh, like this in, 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 that are in the literature. And if you read so, through some of these books I mentioned to you, you can see many more. And so that's what I meant when I said politicized business. Antitrust politicizes business. It enables uh, competitors to run to the government to stop the innovations of their competition. And that's always anti-competitive. Item number four, the last point I, I want to make here is that uh, antitrust violates freedom of contract, freedom of association, property rights, and, and some common law traditions. Not every last common law tradition, but some important common law traditions. Freedom of contract. If I want to merge with your company and we have to work up a contract, as long as we're not uh, uh, aggressing or committing violence against somebody else, freedom of contract is freedom of contract. And so if the government steps in and disallows uh, a merger of that, so of that sort, uh, well, that is an abridgment of freedom of contract. And, uh, and of course, it's supposed to be protected by the U.S. Constitution. There is a contract clause in the Constitution, but uh, the government doesn't pay much attention to that anymore. And so, but that's, I think that's an important thing. Freedom of association. If I want to associate with you in some business enterprise, why shouldn't I be permitted to? As long as we don't commit fraud or aggression or violence against anybody else, it violates that. Private property. What, what anti-merger laws say is that those who support them don't really favor private property in some cases. That is, they don't allow, if you and I are both uh, selling televisions in Auburn, Alabama, and we decide to form one company, uh, and we're not allowed to, now that's telling us that we're not allowed to use our private property in ways that we think will enhance our standard of living. Okay, we may or may not be wrong about whether this is going to work to enhance our standard of living, but a law against that violates our, our right to make, make use of our private property in whatever way we want, again, as long as we don't commit fraud or aggression or violence against somebody else, which we're not. We're just creating a new company. Common law traditions... I'll read uh, a quote by Murray Rothbard here because he had a, a really good uh, ex, uh, statement about, about how uh, uh, the implications of antitrust for common law traditions. He says, uh, let's see. The antitrust laws do not uh, diminish monopoly. What they do accomplish is to impose a continual capricious harassment of efficient business enterprise. The law in the United States is couched in vague, indefinable terms, permitting the administration and the courts to omit defining in advance what is a monopolistic crime and what is not. Whereas Anglo-Saxon law has rested on a structure of clear definitions of crime, known in advance and discoverable by a jury after due legal process, the antitrust laws thrive on deliberate vagueness and ex post facto rulings. No businessman knows when he has committed a crime and when he has not, and he will never know until the government, perhaps after another shift in its own criteria of crime, swoops down upon him and prosecutes. The effects of these arbitrary rules and ex post facto findings of crime are manifold. Business initiative is hampered. Businessmen are fearful and subverts, 
subservient to the arbitrary rulings of government officials like church lady, that's my uh, uh, insert, and business is not permitted to be efficient in serving the consumer. Such business always tends to adopt those practices and that scale of activity which maximize profits and income and serve consumers best. Any harassment of business practice by government can only hamper business efficiency and reward inefficiency. Now, this business about ex post facto laws, which of course are supposed to be unconstitutional, was on display when this same cabal that, that I just mentioned is written by Heilman's book, uh, described in Heilman's book, Heilman's book uh, snookered Bill Gates into appearing before a United States Senate uh, hearing uh, before the lawsuit was filed. And I saw it on C-SPAN. And there was Bill Gates all by himself. And I think he had one of his associates. wasn't even his lawyer. just some other guy from Microsoft with him. And he's 10 or 12 senators up there. And they all had furrow brows and frowns on their faces. And Orrin Hatch was the leader of this ring that was out there. And they were all pointing at doing a Bill Clinton, kind of pointing their fingers at Bill Gates. And I watched this, and essentially what they were all saying is, Mr. Gates, we don't know that you're doing anything illegal, but if we decide someday that you are, you could be in very big trouble. <laughs> now, these are the, the men who make the laws and are supposed to tell us what's legal and what's illegal. They call themselves lawmakers, don't they? You know, it's their job, in a, uh, supposedly in a free society, to let the citizens know what's legal and what's illegal. After all, in the totalitarian countries like the Soviet Union, uh, they used arbitrary law to be able to arrest their political opponents on a whim and on purpose. Uh, but antitrust law is exactly like that. Uh, any business person in, uh, you know, on the whim of any politician or bureaucrat uh, can be sued for violating the law by doing something that the government led him to believe was perfectly legal for 10 or 12 years or longer. And we've, always, we've always done it this way. And so uh, that's how Murray put it. And I'll, uh, the final thing I'll say is uh, I'll read you this uh, quote by Alan Greenspan that's been often quoted about uh, antitrust. This is from that article on antitrust in the, the Ayn Rand book, uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. He says, The world of antitrust is reminiscent of Alice's Wonderland. Everything seemingly is, yet apparently isn't, simultaneously. It is a world in which competition is lauded as the basic axiom and guiding principle, yet too much competition is contemned, condemned as cutthroat. It is a world in which actions designed to limit competition are branded as criminal, taken by businessmen, yet praised as enlightened when initiated by the government. It is a world in which the law is so vague that businessmen have no way of knowing whether specific actions will be declared illegal until they hear the judge's final verdict after the fact, after it's all over with, end quote. Now, Alan Greenspan wrote this before he became a central planner, so I don't know if he still believes this, but I suspect he does uh, still believe that.